right, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you that are new here, um, my name is Shelby Pritchard. I am the IPM specialist here at SDSU, as well as the moderator for the webinar series. Um, and I appreciate all of you taking time out of your morning to be here with us today. Um, just a quick um, reminder, we do have a short poll at the end of the presentation. Um, we ask that you take the time to fill that out. It just helps us with everything. Um, and also I will have a CCA credit available at the end of the presentation as well. Um, we ask that you ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, we can stop and answer those um, at any time. And I'll just jump into it. We have one speaker today, that is Dr. Ken Hellevang. Uh, Ken has a PhD degree in engineering, is a registered professional engineer, and has obtained the academic rank of tenured professor at North Dakota State University. Um, as an extension outreach engineer of agricultural and biosystems engineering at NDSU, he has provided educational and technical assistance in drying, in grain drying and storage structures with a focus on energy efficiency, indoor environmental engineering, primarily related to moisture and mold and flood preparation and recovery to farmers, citizens, agribusiness and professionals across the United States and internationally since 1980. Um, and today, um, Ken will be talking about grain storage management for 2022. So with that, go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I uh, intend to touch on a few key points on grain storage management. Um, but as was already uh, mentioned, that I'm happy to try to respond to questions or uh, elaborate a little bit more if there are any questions as we go along. So with that, we'll go forward. The first thing uh, that I've done <laughs> over the years, I guess, is talk about storage management. Uh, and there's some key parts that, that we typically talk about, monitoring the grain, aerating, those kinds of things. But I uh, kind of decided if, uh, just a couple of years ago that we really need to talk about what the definition is for managing our grain. If you look at the definition for manage, it is to direct with a degree of skill. Uh, and I think that's very critical is that we understand some about what's taking place in a grain bin, a uh, little bit about the drying and storage uh, recommendations that exist. And so that's what I'm gonna focus a lot on today each year throw is different. Uh, each one throws us some, some challenges. And so understanding those fundamentals allows us to do a better job of, of managing that grain. First off, when we talk about management, it, it's critical that we be monitoring the condition of the grain. And with that, we're typically talking about monitoring the grain temperature, the grain moisture content, looking for insects and uh, hopefully not, but even the presence of, of deterioration or mold growth. Frequently, uh, we think of the, the moisture content that we put the grain in at and assume that it's staying at that moisture content. Uh, we'll cover a little bit more on moisture meters and testing of grain moisture, but it's pretty easy to uh, have that moisture measurement at harvest uh, be influenced and, and maybe not be totally accurate. Plus, as we go through the storage season, uh, there's things that are taking place that may change the moisture content. So it's critical that we be monitoring not only the temperature, but the moisture. I recommend that we need to check that stored grain uh, every two weeks until it's cooled down for winter storage, maybe every two to three weeks during the, the coldest time of the year, 
And then as temperatures start moderating in the spring, go back to checking at least every two weeks. And when we're talking about what options we have, really we're, we're thinking of uh, running fans or removing that grain to, to either aerate that grain or dry the grain. And so a lot of times it comes back to then uh, being able to handle either insect problems or moisture problems by aeration and drying. When we look at the recommended moisture content for long-term storage, uh, I typically go back and talk about equilibrium moisture content. What we're trying to do with grain moisture content is to keep it dry enough so that mold does not grow on our stored grain. That uh, is going to be related to a principle that we call equilibrium moisture content. Basically, if, if we take grain and expose it to a certain temperature and relative humidity, it'll eventually come to equilibrium. And that is what we call the equilibrium moisture content. In this slide, what we're showing is air at 70 degrees and 60% relative humidity. If we put hard red spring wheat in that environment, it'll eventually equilibrate or come to a moisture content of 13.3. I pick 60% relative humidity because typically if that relative humidity gets to about 70% or higher, that is, is a high enough relative humidity that we'll see mold growth. So when we start looking at recommended uh, moisture contents for storage, particularly as we go into spring and summer or long-term storage, we're gonna be looking back to that equilibrium moisture content and using that to determine what moisture content we need to be at. So for example, with barley, uh, the equilibrium moisture content for 70 degrees and 60% relative humidity is 11.8% moisture. And the recommended moisture content for barley storage into the summer months is 12% moisture. If we skip down and look at corn, equilibrium moisture content is 12.8. Recommended long-term moisture content then is 13. Many people think of corn being marketed at 15 and a half percent moisture and think of that as the moisture content that we should be striving for. And that'll work fine over winter when we have colder temperatures. But if we're going into uh, summer temperatures, we really need to be down to closer to 13 percent moisture. Soybeans, uh, equilibrium moisture content is 10.2 and really long-term recommended is 11%. We're conducting some research here, uh, looking at a number of different uh, parameters of, of soybeans. Maybe we can, can look at a little bit wetter than, than 11, but 12% moisture uh, would be right on the, the borderline. So, Again, market moisture content is 13, but if we're gonna be storing during the summer, 13% uh, will, will likely cause us trouble. And then if we look at wheat, 13.3 is equilibrium moisture content, 13 and a half is typically what's talked about for long-term storage. As long as temperatures are cold, we can get by with higher moisture contents. And for corn, for example, uh, we have a lot of, of people that will harvest corn at maybe 17, 18% moisture and store that very successfully over winter. And if we're looking at this table, and this table is on my website, uh, there's other uh, tables similar to that that you can refer to. But if we're looking at, 
at 18% moisture and 30 degrees, we have an allowable storage time that exceeds 300 days. Uh, if we can even go up to 20% moisture, as long as we keep it at or below freezing, that works fine. But as temperatures start warming up, uh, if we get to 50 degrees, now the allowable storage time is only 50 days. So in order to hold that high moisture grain over winter, it is critical that we be looking at that uh, lower moisture content or uh, at cold temperatures. Another way that this table is, is helpful is that if we look at 15% moisture, which is our market moisture content on corn, and we go out to a summertime temperature in the top of the bin of 80 degrees, we're only looking at about a 70 day allowable storage time. Now these are cumulative. So we will have used up some of that during the spring. And certainly as we go into the summer temperatures, we're gonna have storage problems if we're trying to hold that corn at 15% moisture. I mentioned earlier the accuracy of our moisture measurement, uh, grain moisture content uh, as we try to measure it with our different types of meters uh, is that moisture reading is influenced by temperature. And so most of our meters today are measuring the temperature of the grain, trying to make an adjustment based on that temperature and give us an estimate of what that moisture content is. If we're working with grain that is, is below about 40 degrees, likely that uh, adjustment is, is going to be an error. Uh, some of the meters will give you an error reading, others will just give you a number. And so I caution people, particularly in our Northern climate, where we have a lot of grain stored at temperatures below 40 degrees, that even these high uh, cost units, the expensive ones that might be at elevators, uh, they may not be accurate on that very cold grain. Any moisture variation, uh, such as after drying or condensation on the kernels will influence the, the moisture reading. So I really recommend that, that we place a sample in a sealed container, warm it to room temperature at about 70 degrees, have our meter at roughly that same temperature, uh, typically, we're going to be looking at six to eight hours for this to occur and then checking the moisture content. That's going to give us the most accurate way of determining our moisture measurement. Those of you that have been storing grain for any period of time know that uh, we're going to be much more successful storing grain if we are coring our bins. Uh, typically what farmers will do is probably peak the grain in the bin uh, during harvest and then come back and withdraw some of that grain to level that top surface. That really helps us in two ways. One, by coring that bin, typically we're taking out the fines and foreign material that is accumulated in the center of the bin. And then the other part is that it's leveling that bin so that uh, we don't have a peak that is exposed to the cold and warm conditions, which tend to cause us more problems. Gives us more uniform airflow through that bin as well. And so uh, I get numerous reports from people that are storing grain that said that they had problems until they started coring and coring really made all the difference. This is a visual I put together a number of years ago uh, that really tries to illustrate how we should be managing that temperature and the, the benefits of controlling that grain temperature. 
The, the curve line that you see on this uh, visual is the average monthly temperature for North Dakota. South Dakota is gonna be a couple degrees warmer, but it's pretty similar to what we have for North Dakota numbers. If we're uh, looking at the different, what I call temperature bands, uh, 70 degrees and warmer is, is optimum for insects and spoilage. We don't want our grain at, at that temperature uh, to try to minimize storage problems. In the 50 to 70 degree band, insect reproduction will occur, but is reduced, and we can still have insect activity. In that 30 to 50 degree temperature band, insects go into dormancy, and below 30 degrees, if we hold it there for a period of a few weeks, we're actually going to be able to kill the insects. So depending on what temperature the grain was as it went into storage, we need to be running the aeration fan and cooling that grain, uh, maybe in multiple steps as we go through the fall and bringing it down to about 20 to 25 degrees for winter storage. If we get a, a 20 degree temperature differential within that stored grain, that's enough to drive what we call convection currents that will move moisture through the bin. Uh, and so with North Dakota average cold month being January at about seven degrees, if we get it down to that 20 to 25 degree temperature range, we're staying within that or less than that 20 degree temperature difference. As we go into spring, uh, we may want to run the aeration fan to help keep that grain cool, uh, but really the goal should be to try to keep the temperature as close to just above freezing as we can. So I list the grain temperature of 35 to 40 degrees, and that should be our goal as, as we go through the spring and into the summer. Those temperature numbers that I gave for insects uh, differ slightly from this table, but um, gives you an idea of, of the research that was done uh, that shows the impact of temperature on insects. We get down to that 40 degree range, insects are dormant uh, in the 55 to 75, Activity is reduced uh, in that 77 to 90 degree temperature range, that optimum for insect reproduction. We get down below freezing, and we, as I indicated, can kill insects if the grain is held there for a period of weeks. And if we get it below zero, we have death within hours. However, I've got guys that'll run the fans when it's below zero and uh, thinking that that's helping us from a storage standpoint. And in reality, I think that that's maybe leading us to some condensation problems in the spring. So I do not recommend cooling the grain below about that 20 to 25 degree temperature range. How long do we need to run the fan in order to, to cool a full bin? Uh, we can estimate that by taking the number 15 and dividing it by the airflow rate. Many of our aeration systems today are set up with an airflow rate of about 0.2 cubic feet of air per minute per bushel. At that airflow rate, we're looking at about 75 hours to completely temp change the temperature of the grain in the bin. So roughly a three days of fan time to, to do a temperature cycle in that bin. We don't need a huge fan in order to do that. Uh, and the example that I show here is a 42 foot diameter bin 
36 feet deep. And I'm using soybeans in this example. So we have about 40,000 bushels of soybeans, just a five horsepower, low speed centrifugal fan will give us that two tenths of a CFM per bushel and cool that whole bin in roughly that three days. I think it's helpful for us to, to think about what's happening with the temperature in this bin. Uh, there certainly is going to be temperature changes during the day uh, with that temperature swing normally being somewhere in the neighborhoods of about 20 degrees. So it might be colder at night, warmer in the daytime, but there's a, a layer at the bottom of the bin that, that I call the buffer zone. And so it, it helps to average out the temperature that is going through the grain. And so the bulk of what we see in that bin is going to be near the average temperature. Now, if we get a major temperature swing, that of course then will, will change the temperature profile in the bin. But if we had three days of, of a pretty much consistent temperatures with that 20 degree swing during the day, the grain temperature is gonna end up pretty close to the average during that three day period. I've been using this slide for, for many years to really try to convince people that an aeration system is, is your best investment that you have on the farm. Um, all the numbers are there. You can go through and look at it, uh, but it's the calculations that went into uh, determining what the cost would be for controlling the temperature of stored corn uh, in a grain bin. And I'm running 12 aeration cycles during the year, which is probably excessive, uh, but it would be the maximum that, that a person might do is, is once a month. Even for that, with 15 cent electricity, we're ending up at less than two cents per bushel for the whole year to control insects and mold in that bin. And I don't think you can find a better investment or return on, on investment than, than that. If you're wanting to calculate what kind of airflow rates you have in your existing grain bins, on my website is a link to the Minnesota Fan Selection Program. Uh, I find it sometimes challenging to find it if you just do a search. So I'll, I'll show you how to find my website and then it's linked off of there. But you can just go in and put the type of crop, bin sizes, and then put on the fan that is on that bin or, or one similar to it, and it'll give you an estimate of what kind of airflow you have in your grain bin. From a grain storage standpoint, um, it's important that we're not adding moisture into that bin. Um, and so I say that the aeration fans or fans should be off during any time when it's, it's snowing, it's raining, or if we have fog. And with fog, we have suspended water droplets. Uh, in the air. Now, this isn't going to rewet the whole bin, but certainly would put moisture into the underfloor space, uh, into the bottom layer of grain that then would need to be removed later. So uh, watch the, the weather forecast and manage the, the fan operation appropriately. One of the, the concerns or problems that we have in the Northern region is 
that if we're running the fans at temperatures that are near or below freezing, we can end up with condensation and icing on the bin vents. And that'll seal up the bin tight enough that if we're pushing air, the, the bin roof gets flexed and it looks like the picture in the middle. Uh, if we're pulling air down, it would suck that bin roof down. And so um, if we're running the fans at temperatures near or below freezing, I recommend leaving the fill and access door open as kind of a pressure relief valve. There are pressure switches that are available that could be used. I don't see them uh, sold very frequently. Uh, so leaving the, the fill hole and the access door opening is probably the easiest solution uh, on our existing bins to make sure that we don't end up with a damaged bin roof. I recommend covering the fans whenever they're not operating. Uh, one is it keeps snow and pests out. Um, I grew up on a livestock ranch in Northeast South Dakota. Uh, went through a number of uh, winters, blizzards there. And I know that that snow gets into every crack and crevice that's available. If we have a, a blizzard event like we had here in North Dakota in the last few days, and we got an open fan like this, there's going to be snow just packed into that underfloor space. Also, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the, uh, the slide, but standing up right in front of the fan is a gopher that I finally got stopped uh, so I could take its picture. The gopher was busy going in with pouches full, coming out with pouches empty. So carrying debris and things into that, that fan or into the grain and not what we wanted. Probably of equal importance is it prevents spring grain warm up. Uh, if we have this fan out, exposed, whenever we have spring winds, it'll blow into that, that open face fan, moving spring warm, moist air through the grain mass. Uh, I did some research a number of years back where I monitored the grain temperature in these uncovered uh, bins. And what I found was that it, the grain was warming to the daily maximum temperatures. And I think that's primarily because here, the wind tends to blow during the daytime and not at night. So we had warm, moist spring air coming into these bins and warming the grain to the, the maximum temperature. So we want some kind of cover over that fan to keep the elements out. And I'm gonna show you another slide here of something that has come up uh, that I think is also related to uh, having an uncovered fan. That concept that I, I'm, I can't look to research to validate this, but I, I get reports from farmers who are referring to ice crystals on the corn in the top of the bin. And I'm gonna just walk through what I think is happening. And this is truly my theory, uh, but I think there's some science behind it. If we have grain at 30 degrees and 15% moisture, that is going to have, that it, air around the grain will have a relative humidity of 60%. The 14 grains is just the, the quantity of moisture that's actually in that air. As that air goes vertically and comes in contact with cold corn on the top of the bin, 
we're going to have condensation. If we look at uh, the dew point, which is where moisture condenses, and we're quite familiar with that, uh, with moisture condensing on our windows during the winter, if we have humidity in the home, that dew point will be at 20 degrees if we're use, storing 15% moisture corn. So if we have corn that is at zero, uh, certainly we're gonna be reaching the dew point. We're gonna have condensation forming, but I think it's gonna be forming in the, in the, in the, with ice crystals as is shown on this window. As we increase the moisture content of the corn that we're storing, that increases the relative humidity, it also increases the, the dew point. And if we look at the amount of moisture in the air, we have 18 grains rather than the 14, <coughs> excuse me. So we definitely are gonna have condensation forming and we're gonna have more moisture if we're working with 18% with moisture corn than we would have at 15. If we were to cool that corn down to 20 degrees in, instead of at 30 degrees, then we're greatly reducing the quantity of actual water that is in the air that would be carried up and forming ice crystals at the top. So if we have a fan connected to our grain bin and that fan does not have some type of cover on it, when we have air wind blowing in the winter time and it's going through corn that has maybe not been cooled uh, at, down to that 20 to 25 degrees, or we have high moisture corn, I think we're going to be seeing ice crystals and moisture accumulating in the top of the bin. As I indicated, I don't have research at this point to validate it, but I think it explains what the reports are that I'm hearing. Kind of a long uh, discussion here on this, but if we get enough of those ice crystals forming on the corn, once it warms up and they melt, now we have a wet layer of corn that can start spoiling on us as we go into spring and summer temperatures. And hopefully that's coming soon. <laughs> if, if we look at the amount of solar radiation occurring, uh, on February 21 and compare that to June 21, if we look on the south wall of the bin, we actually have uh, 1,725 BTUs of heat energy coming from the sun on every square foot of that bin wall. That's twice of what would be occurring during the summer. Now this is a coming for two reasons. One is actually the uh, solar intensity as we go into March uh, is probably the highest that it is during the year. Uh, that's what helps melt all of our snow and, and warm up, uh, the earth up as we go into spring. So, we have outside temperatures that are moderating, and then we have this solar heat gain. Even on the bin roof, uh, we've got 1,800 BTUs in February, June 2,400. So yes, it's, it's more in the summer, but there's still a fair amount of, of solar heating in the, in the top of the bin. Why this is important then is that if we have any moist grain in that bin, uh, we're going to be seeing temperatures probably quicker, the warming up quicker than what we would expect. And when they warm up, then that's going to create storage problems for us. 
Now, if we look at North Dakota numbers, and again, South Dakota will be a couple degrees warmer, but if we look at the average temperature for March in North Dakota, we're at 25 degrees, April 41 degrees, May is 55, but minimum temperatures are still down at 40. So we need to be making use of that cool outdoor air, particularly as we go later into the spring that occurs at night to cool down that corn and try to keep it cool as we go in late spring and into early summer. So that's, if we think back to that visual that I had of running the, the aeration fans in the spring, this is the reason that that's there, is that we need to be um, trying to do what we can to use the outside cool conditions to keep our stored grain cool. This, I do uh, presentations pretty much across the country. And so I put this visual together uh, just to show how the numbers will vary from state to state. As I indicated, South Dakota will be slightly warmer. Uh, if we look at April, maximum temperatures 52 versus 59, minimum 29 versus 34. So it's not a big difference, a couple degrees uh, warmer as we look at South Dakota numbers. We're seeing uh, a lot more grain being stored uh, into the summer and summer management is probably something that we are not uh, as familiar with. Uh, thinking back to what we just talked about as far as, as solar heat gain on the bin roof, if, if Anybody that's been in, in the top of a bin in the summertime knows how hot it can get up there. And so I think we really need to be thinking about what we can do to vent that, that solar heat gain rather than having it warm up our stored grain. Um, if we have openings at the eave and up near the peak, there will be a natural ventilation that'll occur similar to an attic in a building, like in your house. Uh, more and more as we've gone to some of the bigger bins, now we're seeing the uh, fans mounted on the top of the bin roof that are activated by temperature and, and will help uh, keep that headspace or top area cooler. Also, as we go through the summer, uh, we're going to see that top surface warming up. Uh, in this sketch, what I've shown is, is the bottom portion being at 40 degrees, the top portion being at 70 degrees. And in this example, I, I have 17 feet of cool corn, three feet of warm corn. And so going back to that formula, if we have an aeration airflow rate of two tenths of a CFM per bushel, we're looking at 75 hours to cool the whole bin. But we only have uh, roughly three feet out of the 20 feet that needs to be cooled. So we need only about 11 hours of fan operation to cool down that, that top surface. Typically, we're gonna have the coolest temperatures at sunrise. So I do recommend maybe once a month, once every three weeks is we're storing through the summer. So we're talking now uh, maybe June, late June, July into early August that we're looking at running the fan for just a few hours, utilizing the coolest air outside to move the cool air that's within the corn or grain up to cooling down that grain on the top surface. My experience has been that, that we typically start seeing insect infestations in July if we're not doing something to try to keep that top surface cool. So thinking back to the grain temperatures that are associated with insect activity, 
if we can cool that grain down, uh, it's going to make a big difference in how likely we will have insect infestations during the storage period. We have a lot of tools available for us today to monitor what's going on in that bin. Uh, we got thermocouples uh, can be connected to a handheld unit. We've got thermocouples that can be uh, into a, a PC-based monitoring system, signal sent from the grain bin back to your computer, have systems set up with alarms. All of this technology is great, but it does not replace the person still managing that bin. Uh, we need to make sure that the, the system, if we're going to a PC-based system, is monitoring and doing what we want it to do. One of the cautions that I offer related to grain temperature cables is that grain is a good insulator. And so actually grain has an R value or an insulation value of about one per inch. So we get just a couple feet away from the temperature cable and we have an insulation value that's greater than what typically we have in, in many or most of our homes. So uh, it's going, the temperature cable will give us an indication of what is going on in the bin, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't allow us to, to ignore uh, monitoring the grain uh, manually uh, in addition to using these tools. And I offer the same caution. Uh, a lot of the, the systems out there that are being sold will indicate that they can totally take over managing your grain. Well, um, that may be true if the system is all operating accurately. Um, it uh, certainly can help you, but I always say make sure that it's set up to do what you want it to do and then monitor it to, to assure that it is continuing to do that. Uh, some of the units like this is showing are measuring air relative humidity and temperature. Well, uh, most of the relative humidity sensors tend to do what we call drift. And so they may be accurate today, but six months from now, they can be off considerably. Uh, most of them are sensitive to dust exposure and, and other problems. Uh, so in theory, it's, it sounds great, but it still requires the storage manager to be involved. A new tool that is, is starting to show up is carbon dioxide measurement. Um, if we have insect activity or grain spoilage, it's going to produce carbon dioxide. Uh, typically, if we look at uh, what is, is typical as far as carbon dioxide levels, we're probably in that four to 600 parts per million range. If we start getting up to 1,000, 1,500, likely there's, there's spoilage that's taking place. There's still some, uh, I think, debate out as to how do we use these units uh, to accurately measure in a grain bin? Um, but it is something that is available uh, that you may want to consider. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last but not least, I want to talk just a little bit about natural air drying. If we have ice crystals that have formed and melted, or we have wet grain, uh, corn in particular, um, we can do air drying as long as we have an adequate airflow. 
where I talked about 0.2 CFM per bushel in order to aerate the grain. If we're gonna do natural air drying, we need an airflow rate of at least one CFM per bushel. And this table hopefully helps put things in perspective. Uh, now this is, if we were going to dry or change the moisture content of all of the corn in the bin. Typically we would start uh, the natural air drying in April. Again, North Dakota average temperature of about 42, 65% <clears throat> relative humidity gives us 15.3% moisture. One of the things to keep in mind as we're looking at these tables though, is that the um, fan is going to be producing heat that will warm that air a little bit. And so I'm actually gonna look at the April plus five degree numbers, 47 drops the relative humidity to 54% and we're looking at 13.3. But at one CFM per bushel on a full bin, we're still looking at about 46 days of fan time. Now, if we're just drying the top a couple feet, of course we can, in a bin, that might mean that we're running the fan for an hour or something, or an hour. Running the fan for a few days, like a week, uh, rather than that full month of fan time. And as we look at May conditions, we're looking again at very good drying. Surprisingly, uh, April and into May are fairly dry months. You think of it as being a wet time of the year, but when you actually look at the relative humidity of the air, they're fairly low. So. I think being able, to, if we have reasonable airflow in that bin, we can remove some moisture, particularly in the top of the bin, or if we have the full drying system, uh, we can do spring natural air drying. I'm gonna finish uh, with this slide. Um, it would be remiss on my part if I didn't say something about grain safety. Um, the picture on the top left uh, talks about bridging. If we have high moisture grain, it in, for, in essence creates a crust or dome that stretches across the bin. Uh, as we start unloading, that can then impose greater loads on the, the bin wall. And if, enough pressure is concentrated into that grain wall, we can end up with a bin failure. Um, I'm amazed that somebody was there. There must have been some indication that this was about to fail and we were able to capture a very dynamic picture. Unfortunately, uh, we have too many people that, that go into grain bins uh, to try to assist with unloading that bin. And I have a publication that touches on that. It's called Caught in the Grain. Uh, but we don't, there's no good reason to be in a bin while the unloading system is operating. If you're not familiar with all of the the hazards associated with bin entry and recommended entry procedures, I encourage you to, to take the time to become acquainted with all of that information. Last but not least is uh, if we, grain dust in itself is a respiratory hazard, but if we have any uh, molding occurring, uh, mold growth is going to produce spores, which becomes a very major respiratory hazard. And so wearing an N95 mask is a requirement if we're working around this grain. Unfortunately, because of 
COVID, we've become very familiar with our N95 masks, uh, but it's that level of mask that's required to, to provide some protection from those mold spores. So that brings us to the end. Uh, if you're looking for my information, I have found it easiest to just do a search for NDSU grain drying and storage. And that should take you uh, to my website. And I've got links uh, for a fair amount of information there. So with that, I'll open it if there are any questions. All right, and while they're hopefully thinking of some questions, I'll have you stop screen sharing and I'll throw up that CCA code for people. Thank you. No questions currently. Well, if someone has a question and wants to contact me later, uh, I'm certainly open to that. Again, it's pretty easy to find me on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Ken, just a comment. Should, this jack with the extension should be easier to core bins this year with the price way it is, shouldn't it? <laughs> yes. Yep. Let's see. And we got a question from John McMain asking, how cold is it in Fargo today? <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody would have to bring that up. Yeah, we're at 15 <laughs> below zero today. Oh. Yeah, unfortunately, we've had a, a major North Dakota winter this year. We've had, um, I think it's eight actual blizzards. NDSU has been closed more than it's been for several years. Um, and so we've got some snow and we got some cold though. All right, and if there aren't any more questions, um, we'll wrap it up and we hope to see everyone tomorrow when we go over um, market marketing and insurance. Yep. So thanks again. And yeah, we hope to see everyone tomorrow. <laughs>